And the short answer to your question is yes. The difficult part of that is in achieving it. Uh, we will inherit what we inherit should we form government. Uh, British Columbia did meet its first interim target, which is a good thing. We may have numbers on the 2012 target that show it has met the 6% reduction as well. But as Sam has, has correctly pointed out, British Columbia is a resource economy, has new sectors. We've, been, we've, been, we've had a natural gas industry for 50 years, but we now have uh, an era of fracking in this jurisdiction and others that poses real dilemmas on, uh, on, on greenhouse gas emissions in, 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 in our province, to put it mildly. Now, I actually think that Christy Clark had it right when she said to an audience of potential Chinese customers for BC's natural gas that British Columbia should develop the greenest LNG in the world. The problem was she took a f return flight home and came to the legislature and opened up the Clean Energy Act and allowed a definition of clean energy now to include burning gas to produce LNG in British Columbia. So, look, I think, I think the difference with, just sticking to LNG for a minute, the difference between natural gas and liquefied natural gas opportunities in British Columbia uh, over, say, other fossil fuel sectors is there is some social license that is worth pursuing with First Nations. You've got the Heisla, you've got the coastal First Nations. My friend is now the chief in the Haida Gwaii from university days. They all want to sell renewable energy into producing the greenest LNG in the world. That's something that Enbridge and oil pipelines completely lack in British Columbia. It should be a, a, a precondition for doing business in this province. Uh, I've met with uh, chiefs from the Fort Nelson First Nation, and I know there are huge problems around the environmental footprint of fracking. Um, British Columbia needs to look at the jurisdictions that are regulating the industry. We actually have less regulation on fracking activity in our province than Alberta does. And, and I even think there are some people in the industry itself who realize that they're not going to be able to do business in this province unless they have uh, the consent of British Columbians to do that. So we need political space in this province so that taxation and regulation that Bob Simpson talked about a moment ago are what we're talking about in BC as a government. And that's our response. And we need to be talking instead of, we need to move the conversations instead of natural gas companies operating in BC saying, how much is the Crown going to give me for developing this resource? It should be simply about what is the social license British Columbia requires if you're going to be engaged in natural gas activity in British Columbia. And we need the political space of organizations that are sponsoring this debate tonight. But that's what uh, a reforming government needs to look for. Yes, the target is important, but it's going to be tricky to get there. Can we talk to Gabby next, since uh, you're sure. probably I, I, in the second best position of forming government? Is that target important? Well, I'd actually prefer to think that we're in the best position. You just don't know it yet. And you want a surprise in the future in two weeks? Well, you'll get it, right? So you'll get it in the next few weeks. So surprise me with an answer on uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Well, <laughs> when, you, when you think about emissions, right? I mean. There's one thing we're raised with, and one thing I was raised with was that you think globally, act locally. You know, one thing that BC's done well has, you know, we, you, I mean, Rob has agreed. I mean, he, he's already just agreed with the fact that we do need to have uh, some, the greenest, uh, uh, greenest standards in the industry, and BC has already started leading with that you know, in the jurisdictions in North America. I mean, in Terry Lake was just, uh, Minister Terry Lake was just in Oregon, you know, providing some advice to Washington and Oregon uh, around our standards. And what we do as, as a province is to think about our plan, not in isolation just for BC, but in the context of global warming, I mean, of the globe, because it is called global warming, not just BC warming, right? So when you're, lo when you're lowering uh, you know, emissions here, there could be emissions rising in China. So when you are offering a cleaner alternative to you know, coal burning in China, then you're preventing you know, some Chinese factories, Chinese emissions uh, from burning 
more greenhouse gases than you would if you didn't have that cleaner alternative. Is that the That's what I'm talking about, LNG here. So. so let's just pause for a second. LNG, liquefied natural gas. I'm sorry, I've, I've let a couple of sort of jargony things slip by and my job is to stop them. So LNG is liquefied natural <coughs> gas. And GHG, when we talk about GHG, we're talking about greenhouse gases. Uh, just because we're throwing all these three-letter acronyms around and uh, you're entirely forgiven if you don't have them all memorized. So put up your hand if you don't understand what somebody's talking about because that's actually really important. Thank you, Gabby. Sam, did you get an answer? Uh, well, one, you did not commit to the 2010 target. Do you do that in a one-word answer? Well, right now, I mean, I'm not in the government. I'm a candidate, so I can't uh, make that commitment. Well, then that's something I would fight for within, you know, we can fight for within the party. Okay. And the second thing is uh, I notice you say that, you know, our natural gas is better than coal and it's going to be replacing coal, therefore lowering emissions. Uh, could you explain that? Because it seems to me that uh, our natural gas would actually just be replacing more expensive sources of uh, clean energy, such as solar or wind or nuclear, because these jurisdictions don't have the proper price on carbon that would make our natural gas, uh, that would make those sources competitive. So why is it replacing coal instead of just replacing the development that we actually need in the clean energy sector because it's cheaper? Well, because, because when something's expensive, when something's expensive, you don't replace it with something specific. You replace it with what's cheap. And what's cheap is coal. So if you can replace coal, then you're replacing the alternative. Sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll answer the question. If I'm elected, I'll do everything in my power to make those uh, 2020 emission standards. Uh, I want that for my children. There's no doubt. Um, you mentioned Enbridge. Enbridge, actually, I was at the Canadian Geothermal Energy Association meeting in Calgary uh, two weeks ago to the day and actually had the opportunity to talk with Enbridge and some of the people from that company who are doing renewable energy. They currently are developing 1,365 megawatts of clean renewable energy from solar, wind, and geothermal. But they're not doing it in BC because our government has put up a legislation to block this. It's called the BC Geothermal Resources Act. We're sitting on an energy powder keg right now that could power our province, could power all of Canada if we could tap it, but we can't. The legislation needs to change. If I'm elected, that's what I'm going to go after. This will create a new, huge, huge opportunity for British Columbia to demonstrate leadership. Unlike wind and solar, and I just want to clear up another uh, dispel. When I do work with the United Nations and with the Department of Energy, a lot of people come up and they seem to have a, a perception that all you have to do is put up a, a couple solar panels here and change to LED. The, the change needed in all of our lives, every one of us, myself included, is of orders of magnitude larger than anything that is in your comfort level. That's a very sobering statement, but it's true. Um, I work with the data on this on a daily basis, and I lost hope for a while. I became very discouraged, and it took a while before there was a path that seemed clear for British Columbia. And that path starts with changing the government, and it starts with changing some of the legislation that's in place. And the first piece of legislation that I'm going to rip up is the BC Geothermal Resources Act, which actually prevents geothermal resources investment in British Columbia. We have companies in the rest of Canada trying to invest in clean renewable energy right now, and they're being blocked. So that has to change. Thank you, Dwayne. I think Bob wants to jump in. Bob. You're in a different position because you don't represent a caucus. You don't have a party behind you. So how do you answer that question as an independent representing one constituency? And, and that really is the fundamental question about being an independent or even if we get a couple of Greens in or a couple of Conservatives in, it will require us to work differently. And I want to talk about something that happened in this session uh, that will give you a sense of how that might work. But let me be crystal clear. L Green Energy LNG is a nonsensical string of words. It doesn't, doesn't make any sense at all because the extraction of natural gas 
is one of the highest ecological footprints. You permanently remove and toxify trillions of liters of fresh water. You fragment the land base. You create health and safety uh, implications where those people, I mean, it's just nonsensical to say that you can discount how you get the gas then you can discount the energy to do the conversion and to do the transportation. LNG, we should be saying no to that as vehemently as we should be saying no to Site C. Uh, that's really the reality of it. And force these political parties uh, to stop living in an LNG pipe dream and come into the present and come into reality and figure out what an alternative future would look like without uh, that smoke and mirrors uh, sitting out there. And we had a debate in the House around this, and, and Rob knows this. His House leader came into the House during the debate. He stood and he said, LNG is not an issue that divides us. Those were his words to the liberal MLAs across the floor from him. So that's the next energy minister of the province should the NDP win. How can an independent influence this? Because Sam, we need to meet those targets. They're not a nice to do, they're a must do. And that's why I say that we need to get the political parties beyond treating the carbon tax like today as a hot potato that they bounce back and forth to position themselves in advance of the election and actually you know, agree to what that agenda is that's going to move us forward because they're going to have to take on the power brokers in our society. And if we were doing it collectively, we could move it forward. In this session, uh, if, you, if you've been listening to uh, the stuff around the Pacific Carbon Trust, that's been a two-year project uh, of mine, raising that issue. And finally, the Auditor General joined a voice to it. Rob's been on it as well. Uh, and we're beginning to show how much of a nonsensical approach to climate change the Pacific Carbon Trust is. But in this session, we were able to defeat, with the assistance of social media and the public voice, a rollover of legislation that would give large force corporations uh, you know, control over large tracts of British Columbia's public forest. And in 48 hour period, with the assistance of people, I was in the house fighting this, and with the assistance of the people outside of the house, the forest minister admitted to me he had 3,200 tweets and direct emails to him. His staff did not know what to do with that. That pushed the government over the edge to actually vote against seven sections of their own bill. And the minister came to me at the end of that session and he said, look, you've won, but can you turn the damn thing off? Because we're still getting the emails because people don't know that you've won. We can do this together, but what I think you need are voices outside of these two main political parties that have become so vested in the power game that they've lost sight of why they want power. We need Greens, we need Conservatives, we need independents in that House. Yes, there'll be an opposition, but we can bring your voice into the House in a way that these other political parties can't and won't. Let's go to, let's go to Jane. So Jane, best case scenario, your party picks up a few seats, but it doesn't sound like strategically you're planning on forming government. How do you answer that question and how do you Well, we might the be the official opposition. <laughs> Never know. <laughs> In 1991, there were 17 uh, BC Liberals elected. Uh, uh, it was a surprise election. So yes, we could commit to those, uh, those re greenhouse gas reductions. I would invite everybody to go to our website, greenparty.bc.ca. Our Green Book uh, 2013 is online. It will have one more update before the election. Uh, and in that election, in that update, you'll find um, a new policy which everybody can go and vote on. Uh, it's in our pending policy section, and it's call, calling for a moratorium on new exploration and new LNG projects um, until we have an environmental assessment process that is uh, cumulative in nature that appreciates. Uh, that requires that we have a mapping of our ground and surface water uh, so that we know exactly what um, is up there, uh, that requires the companies that are involved in this to maintain the, the wells after they've been exhausted so that they have to, uh, they're responsible for making sure that there isn't any leakage of the gas into the, into the water resources. We're also, of course, as you know, opposed to the um, Enbridge pipeline 
and to the Kinder Morgan expansion. Uh, we have the most comprehensive policy when it comes to climate change. I couldn't possibly tell you all of the things that are in it in a, in a short um, discussion of climate change. You need to go and see the detail of the things that we propose. We propose, uh, like a Better Futures BC, moving the carbon tax up to $50 a ton to exclude the big emitters that have been excluded previously, the gas, the uh, aluminum, and the cement. Um, and uh, so the Green Party has the most comprehensive policy related to climate change. It's a defining issue of our party, and every single one of our MLAs will go in there and fight for a better future for BC. Thanks, Jean. Um, <clears throat> so one of the things that keeps coming up in the discussion is natural gas, and I think that there's a few issues that we're going to have to take step by step. Um, natural gas has a really nice name compared to some other energy sources. Uh, what I'm hoping is that, Caleb, you could explain to us a little bit about your understanding of what goes into the production and sale of natural gas. And Rob, if you could explain your vision of how that can be tapped into in an ethical and responsible way, because there seems to be a division right now over whether we even accept that natural gas is a, a green way to power our economy. Caleb? Okay, that's a tough one. Um, I guess I have one comment before I start this. Like, you know, I'm hearing a few answers in some positions, but the thing, and even if you reference geothermal, which is very interesting, there's a lot of geothermal potential up in northeastern British Columbia. I guess my, my issue is that it's always my people in our territory on the goddamn chopping block. We're the ones who got to give. You're not, you're not going to put a fracking rig in Point Grey. I mean, it's not going to happen. It, 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 the things that I see, the, there are fires I passed in Alaska Highway, like flare stacks, that have burned every single day of my life. Every single day, like since I was a kid, my first memory is driving up the highway to see my grandparents up in Fort Nelson drive by this big fire in the sky. And to this day, coming down here, that fire still burns. <clears throat> so I, I kind of find it hard to listen to these pronouncements about LNG and transition and even geothermal, which is good. You know, I support that. But the interesting thing is that it's, it's my territory, a long way away from here, that has to give it. And where's the justice in that? Well, because like, we don't have enough voters, we're irrelevant? You know, wh where's the justice in that? What, what is this province that you would give away, you know, again, this territory? And so, yeah, that's my own issue. <clears throat> um, on natural gas, a beautiful term of art uh, that doesn't really describe the reality. Um, to my eye, and in my mind's eye, natural gas looks like hundreds of trucks full of sand and chemicals and water. It looks like the Sierra Yo-Yo de Sand Road punched over our vehement objections into the heart of my grandparents' trap line. Um, it looks like uh, massive amounts of contaminated oil and contaminated waste, uh, contaminated dirt that drives down the highway to 120 kilometers an hour. I lost my windshield driving here because uh, a truck passed me at a buck 40 carrying rocks and one of them came out. Um, so when we talk about natural gas, we're talking about something much different than these beautiful pictures painted about, you know, oh, we go and put some wells down, it's great. You know, it, <laughs> it's a world apart. And then the tr truth is, you guys have to come see it. You know, get, get out of this, like, you know, urban reality. Come up north and check it out. You know, don't, don't take my word for it. You know, don't, I mean, come see fractured land, please. But don't, <laughs> don't, don't believe us. Don't buy the hype. Come up and look. Come up and look. Well, <laughs> cancer rates, I mean, my grandfather's dying of colon cancer. My other grandpa died of pancreatic cancer. They, they ate moose every day of their life. They hunted on the land. They, lived, they drank mountain water. Why do these people die that way? It's a peculiar thing. But again, you know, I can't quantify that. I can't take that to court yet and win that case, although I am trying. And sorry, I can't, I can't give an answer I think that describes it because it's very personal for me. But the one thing I will say is that all of you guys, and, I, and it, it's those up on the panel as well, like, come look. Come see. You know, come, my family will host you. We'll feed you moose meat. You've talked about Vegetarian. hundreds, hundreds of trucks. Yeah, well, <laughs> uh, when we looked at that map, yeah. just the geographical area, I mean, that, that map was all of northeastern British Columbia. That's a huge territory. Yeah. So we're talking about a scale that maybe most of us aren't familiar with from having driven past those flare stacks and, uh, and those trucks on the highway. So how does that, how does that mesh with your vision of a, of, a, of a green economy, Rob? I think you, you have to look at natural gas in the context of where it might be used. It would not be green at all to burn it in British Columbia to produce electricity because we have 93% clean electricity in this province. It would make no sense to use natural gas 
in developing electricity in Manitoba or Quebec for the very same reason. It would make sense to use natural gas to produce electricity as a transition fuel in Alberta where they or Saskatchewan where they uh, primarily use thermal coal to produce their electricity. So natural gas was critical for the United Kingdom, for example, being becoming one of the first uh, G20 countries and European Union countries to meet their Kyoto Protocol targets. Um, it is also displacing a lot of greenhouse gases in the United States. I think they've seen a 7% decline in GHGs in the USA since the Obama administration took over, their mainly from displacing also went coal. Down the tubes, though, right? Well, mainly from displacing coal. The, the worst investment you can make uh, in the United States right now is in coal assets. Uh, they are stranded assets for en energy producing coal plants. Um, so, in a, in, a, in a jurisdiction with primarily dirty electricity production, natural gas makes a lot of sense. And perhaps China and other Asia Pacific countries that wish to buy natural gas, LNG from British Columbia, um, there is a case to be made there. Uh, but it if would make. The, if we're the vendor, how do we decide how it's used? What if people in Alberta want to yeah. use it to, for example, power oil sands production? Or how do we determine as the vendor right. how that's used? Well, British Columbia's traditional market for almost all of our natural gas has been the United States. That will probably close entirely in about 10 years from British Columbia. They have their own supply. So really the debate is about having any natural gas industry in British Columbia uh, or having an LNG type industry. Now, we cannot treat LNG as, you know, I think Premier Clark and other boosters of the industry do to say, you know, this is a great bonanza. We're going to realize hundreds of billions of dollars of of money and, and, and put all of our economic eggs in that one basket, that, that would be insanity. There are real problems with it around greenhouse gas emissions. Um, the pace and scale that, that could be proposed, and there's a lot of big players sniffing around British Columbia, is probably a lot of pie in the sky, but that would be disastrous too if it came to fruition. But I think what British Columbia needs to do, because you know somebody mentioned a moratorium, well the, the horses have unfortunately left the barn on that because British Columbia has this industry, unlike for example, New Brunswick. What we need to do is have a very strong and thorough review of fracking uh, in British Columbia right now. And that's what a new government should immediately set to work to do. It's going to take the right personalities to head that up, but it needs to look at everything. Water use, water reuse, water storage, greenhouse gas impacts. All of the regulatory gaps in British Columbia need to be examined, uh, human health impacts, all of those things. because. There are other places in North America that are doing a far better job than British Columbia, and British Columbia needs to, needs to quite frankly catch up. In the US, in states like Illinois and other places, you've got the National Resources Defense Council, the Sierra Club of the USA, environmental defense, all of the major green NGOs sitting at the table and working with legislators to come up with strong regulations. And if, if the industry can't guarantee uh, that water is gonna be contaminated and human health isn't gonna be put at risk, then the industry doesn't get a social license to do business so in this province. And that's what the point of that should be. I hear a commitment to a review process. Uh, we've got yeah. three candidates who want to jump in. Yeah. I, there, well, there's three specific questions. I mean, it's difficult, Rob, when we haven't seen any platform or any concerted vision from the NDP as the party that's going to form government. So it's, it's really tough because I think you're a genuine person and, and you and I know each other, but what is it that the party and what is it your leader wants to do? So three specific questions. Number one, will you price water? Because until there's a price on water, we will not drive change to something that's alternative to hydraulic fracking. Number two, will you say an absolute no to the Liard uh, and say there will be no hydraulic fracking in a third watershed in British Columbia up in that uh, area while you look at what's happening in the Montagne and the Horn? Uh, number three, uh, will you say uh, that your um, government will actually sit down as part of what it does in the review and actually map the cumulative impacts and take cumulative impacts into the pricing of the extraction and the licensing that you do? Because those three things would then force the kind of changes that I think everybody wants to see up in that area. So there's three specific questions. Well, Bob, you, as you know, because we put out a four-point plan on uh, hydraulic fracturing in British Columbia uh, as an opposition, um, we've put out more detail than those who have the entire bureaucracy at their disposal in government, and that's the whole point. We know that if we become an incoming administration, one of the first things we're going to have to set to work at on is 
uh, hydraulic fracturing and the and environmental impacts that it's causing. Uh, we've already called for water rental rates to apply to this industry. I don't even think the Liberals can explain why the mining sector or forestry pays for water in British Columbia, but for some reason natural gas does not. We've also said that the Oil and Gas Commission, which is the regulator, and I'll put it in quotations, of this industry should not be issuing water licenses and permits. That should re remain and be transferred back to the environmental stewardship branch of the Ministry of the Environment because they will do the things that Jane was talking about in terms of looking at uh, uh, recharge rates if it's, if it's an aquifer source, a, a groundwater source, or surface water withdrawal. withdrawal. That is not being done. It's, it's, a, uh, it's a bonanza atmosphere, as I said, up in, up in that region right now. We've seen it from the map. Caleb's talked about it uh, in, in that experience. And there is no cumulative impacts uh, included in the Environmental Assessment Act of British Columbia. Those are vital, important reforms that you get to implement if you form a majority government. And we'd be happy to work with the independents, and if there's a green MLA or two in the legislature, to have the support to do that, because we haven't seen any action like that from the Liberals. We've seen year after year pass by, and now British Columbia is at the bottom of the barrel in terms of the standards that it makes its natural gas industry adhere to on this continent. Okay, we're gonna get Dwayne and then Gabby to jump in. Um, thank you, Rob. You're sort of in the, uh, the hot seat tonight, but that's, Sorry. we knew that was gonna happen, that's why they sent you, right? <laughs> um, I just wanted to put this up on the screen, thank you, Heather. That's, when we're talking about LNG, liquefied natural gas, and we're talking about exports, that's just to give you some visual context. That those golf balls are each full of liquefied natural gas, and it takes a lot of energy, of course, to convert natural gas into a, a state in which it can be shipped. But, Dwayne, you wanted to, uh, to jump in with a response. Sure. I wanted to actually address you, Caleb. Um, my family came from Sweden in 1903, and we were settled in Kingdersley, and my grandmother told me stories that are similar to yours. Um, she, unfortunately, passed away 97 years old a year and a half ago. Um, she had gas and oil wells on her property too, uh, all over the property as a matter of fact, so I know how, you, how that looks. I've seen it firsthand. Um, I think her compensation when we went through her will, the oil and gas companies gave her uh, something like uh, $250 a year for royalties, or for land, leasing the land. Um, on the geothermal thing, you're right, the area, your ancestral home has a rich abundance of thermal energy. Um, but it wouldn't make sense to actually use the geothermal energy there. It would make a lot more sense to use it closer to here, closer to the point of consumption, because the transmission loses energy in the process. Um, where it would make sense is in closed-circuit geothermal systems. You can actually... Uh, so for those of you who don't know what a closed-circuit enhanced geothermal system is, um, you drill... Yeah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> a few, I guess. I'm just going to go out on a one. Um, if you were to drill down two to three kilometers, uh, the, cer the temperature, it's called the bottom hole temperature, would be roughly, you know, 300, 400 degrees. If you hit what's called a geothermal reservoir, it's a place where the rocks are porous and water can move through it, taking the heat out of the, out of the rock. You drill another hole and you push water down into the hole. Uh, it's like a natural fracking process, but without the chemicals. The water goes through, captures the heat, turns into steam, the steam is used to power a turbine, the steam condenses and the same water is put back into the ground again and you get energy. And unlike um, wind or solar, it's 24-7. It doesn't only work when the sun or the wind is on. Um, it would work very well to help reverse some of the damages done on, on your lands because when you put water down, you can also sequester CO2 deep within the earth. So it actually is a technology that has a positive footprint. We have an abundance of it all over the planet, not just in one area of the planet. Um, to address you, your point you made, one of the things that disturbs me as a taxpayer is the lack of regulatory oversight that the BC Utilities Commission has in BC Hydro. I want that changed. Gabby, we want to give you the chance to jump in as well uh, on natural gas, or if you want to take it to to other infrastructure projects, go for it. Well, I think uh, wow, that's you know, there's been a lot of things that have that have passed since uh, Caleb initially started, and what I wanted to address was you know, Caleb, um, tremendous respect for what you do and uh, for speaking up for your people. I mean, we we're here today because we're talking about you know, enfranchisement. And part of that is stepping up and doing things like what Caleb's doing. 
and, and I definitely respect that, and I do will, when elected, take you up on your offer. Actually, you probably even if not elected, take you up on your offer and let's go, all right? One of the things that is important to me as a candidate and as somebody here who, like you, is concerned about my future is you know, not just the climate change, but how we transition to that. This is why something like LNG right now is important because you, I mean, Rob uses the word bonanza, but it's, there are opportunities here. There are opportunities that we have to take advantage of. I mean, uh, Rob is, you know, the NDP has, uh, has borrowed the plan and is, is you know, helping us you know, uh, explain it a little bit, explain the benefits. Thank you, Rob, that's fantastic. Uh, but you know, we have to understand that the, the BC Liberals have a further plan on top of that. You know, why they're doing that is so that you can create something like a prosperity fund where you can find, start using that money, uh, that endowment, to finance other projects that, that could be important to this province. And that includes you know, things that move towards moving our goals, our GHG goals and other environmental goals you know, can come from that prosperity fund. So that's, uh, there's a lot of potential and I think you have to balance what we have right now with how we get to where we need to go in the future. 